The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will start shortly.
Ashba and uh, welcome to this uh, special additional session of uh, uh, the Treasury Committee uh, to discuss the recent turmoil that we've seen in the banking sector uh, and in particular Silicon Valley Bank UK. Uh, very grateful to you, Governor, for finding the time to come in and speak to us on this issue. I know you've got a hard stop at 11.30. Uh, meeting, appreciate so. you've, you've made time in your diary to come in and speak to us and that we will be talking to you about uh, monetary policy and inflation the next time we see you uh, in May. So today is all about the banking uh, sector and uh, starting with you, Governor, may I ask the witnesses to introduce yourselves? Yes, Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England. Mm. Sam? Sam Woods, head of the PRA. Uh, Dave Ramsden, Deputy Governor for Markets, Banking, Payments and Resolution. Thank you so much. Now. Clearly, it's been a very busy time for all of you um, over March. And um, would you uh, say that uh, the events that led to the rescue of Silicon Valley Bank UK um, came out of left field? Were you taken by surprise? Yes, I would say that, actually. Um, I mean, my experience, which goes back 30 years now, um, it's probably the fastest I'm talking about the parent bank in the US to start with, actually. Um, the fastest passage from mm. sort of health to death, mm. really since Bearings, actually, mm. I'd say. I mean, Bearings, mm. um, as you'll remember, yeah. um, you know, was a sort of Friday to Sunday thing, mm. and this was pretty similar. Mm. Uh, so, yes, I mean, I would, if you don't mind, draw, draw a distinction with Credit Suisse, which we might come on to, which is mm. actually a much more drawn out affair. But mm. yes, it was a very fast passage mm. to, uh, to mm. failure. So you mentioned uh, Credit Suisse uh, there, Governor, and uh, obviously quite a few of banking stocks, regional banks in the US. Um, mm. We've heard in recent days uh, pressure on the share price of Deutsche Bank and so on. Um, you probably won't want to comment on areas outside the UK, but I just wondered uh, whether you think today that these individual idiosyncratic events are now past and that um, things have settled down and uh, this turmoil in the banking sector in March is behind us? Well, we've, we've sent you an assessment of the mm. UK banking mm. sector and obviously we'd be very happy to discuss any points you want to t discuss out of that. I think, I think the US authorities are still dealing with you know, some of the consequences of mm. the, uh, the issue in the regional banks that, mm. that manifested itself in uh, Silicon Valley Bank. I think Credit Suisse, I would say, and obviously, as you say, come on to happy to talk about that, um, is a rather institutional specific story mm. about long run issues uh, in the institution. So, my view, and I'm certainly I've my very strong view with the UK banking system, is that it is in a strong position, uh, both capital and liquidity wise. Uh, it is not showing signs of, uh, of, of problems in that respect. And we tested, as you know, very extensively. Mm. Um, I, I also think that what we saw at the tail end of last week, Friday in particular, when the, yeah, there were, there were uh, quite sharp market movements, you know, I, think, I think there are moves in markets to, if you like, test out firms. I would not want to say that those, in my estimation, are based on uh, identified weaknesses more than testing out. I mean, there is quite a bit of testing out going on at the moment. I think. And last September, obviously, there was the stress test of the liability-driven investing, which was way outside the parameters of any stress test that you had run. Um, Sam, have any of these developments been outside the stress tests of the sorts of things that you model for? Well, I'd make a distinction here between the capital treatment of interest rate risk, which was a relevant factor in the demise of the parent bank, um, Silicon Valley. Um, we do capitalise that risk very thoroughly for UK banks, including, by the way, for Silicon Valley Bank UK. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm entirely content that the stresses we've seen are inside the types of stresses that we apply for capital purposes. Where I think there might be more of a policy question, it's an international question in which we'll take a close interest, is around the calibration of the liquidity coverage ratio. So that's the sort of one month liquidity, if you like, the banks have to hold. And um, uh, as Andrew was just mentioning, a very striking feature of the Silicon Valley Bank uh, run, not so much of the Credit Suisse one, by the way, was just the speed with which it took place. And I think there's a table in Andrew's letter quite helpful. What you can see is basically 3 billion deposits or 2.9 going out in a day on Friday the 9th 
of March, um, the sort of outflow rates that we have, so the, the percentage of deposits that are assumed to run out in that LCR ratio, some actually are 100 percent. So deposits from financial institutions are assumed all to go, but operational deposits are less than that, and retail deposits less still. So I think there's going to be a question for all of us as to whether, but it is a question I emphasize, whether those outflow rates are quite high enough. Well, I think um, it, it's much easier now, isn't it, to move your deposits electronically. Uh, you don't have to queue round the block mm. to take your money out of a particular bank. You can move it within seconds. And so presumably you will have to think about what it is that you stress test for when you're looking at some of these um, rules. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, all, all of us can move money you know, from our accounts in a short time and it's taken mm. me to answer this question, as you say. Uh, and that is a relatively new feature mm. of the market. The other aspect that we've had, and we have dealt with, by the way, in various mm. situations in the past, but it's more prominent, is the speed with which news can travel, mm. particularly among mm. communities and sometimes mm. sort of uh, through, through private messaging mm. groups. That, that is a noticeable mm. phenomenon both here and elsewhere. I, I do think that in this case, you also had an issue that you asked about in your letter, mm. which was the concentrated nature of mm. the deposit base of this particular firm. Mm. I think that was an exacerbating mm. factor but we're going to have to look at all that for mm. sure. And, and um, uh, just one moment, Dave. Uh, um, Governor, in terms of um, uh, the events of March, um, I'm not sure that I heard a clear sort of yes-no answer to my question about were these some pressures at idiosyncratic cases around the world? It was, is this something more systemic? And would you be able to say today, as we end, near the end of March, um, that this turmoil is behind us? Well, I think there is a story in the Silicon Valley Bank US case, which I think we will come on to, I'm sure, which is to do with the treatment of it, what we call interest rate risk in the banking book. So this is not trading activity, this is interest rate risk in the bank. Um, we treat that differently in our capital regime, which I think we set out in the, in the paper we sent you, and I'm happy to, you know, we'd be happy to go through that. Um, we, we treat it differently to the US, um, and, and that is an important difference. So I think there is an issue there, um, because of course that obviously goes back. To, we're sorry, we're not out of the woods. The bank no, is not I mean, out of the woods. That, that is an issue, but it's not, I think, an issue in, in, in the UK because we do treat it differently, and that obviously relates to the question of the you know, of the rise in interest rates and how much and mm -hmm. how quickly. I think. There's a lot that was there, there was a lot that was idiosyncratic about Credit Suisse, mm -hmm. um, uh, which we can you know, say a bit about. But obviously, it's not one of ours a, 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 as a parent. Now, to your question, I don't think that any of them, and we've said this, that any of these you know features cause you know, stress in the UK banking system. Mm -hmm. But you know, to, I, I, the definitive yes-no answer to your question mm. goes back to what you said about the markets mm. last week. They are trying on to mm. find you know, points of, of weakness mm. at the moment. Now, I don't think we are at all in the place we were in in 2007 8 mm. We're in a very different place to then. Mm. But you know, we have to be very vigilant. So you know, if I give you the answer, I don't think there's a problem going forward. Mm. I do not want to give you for a mm. moment the idea that we are not very vigilant, mm. because we are. We are in a period of very heightened... You know, mm. frankly, tension and alertness, yeah. and we will go on being vigilant. Yeah. So, in a way, that's the that's the message I'd really yeah. like to give you, if you don't okay. mind, in answering that question. Okay, thank you, um, Dave. You wanted to make yeah, a I, point. I, I, yeah. Thanks, Chair. All I wanted to really do was was illustrate the the point Andrew was making about the wider context. I mean, when you think of what's going on in global financial markets mm. at the moment. I mean, the US Treasury market, one of the most liquid in the world, mm. implied volatility last week, close to post-global financial mm. crisis highs. So you've got the, the recent um, events in these particular banks that have, you know, the markets have responded to, and as Andrew says, are testing but that, that also plays into a longer term picture. You know, we've all appeared before you to talk about uh, the LDI episode last mm. autumn, where you've seen these events, you know, off the scale moves in markets triggering mm. um, uh, responses. Well, so I think we, this is why we have to remain incredibly vigilant, mm. Mm. Uh, looking for, uh, you know, focusing and monitoring very closely as we've actually said last week in the Monetary Policy Committee minutes, you know, we'll keep a close mm. eye on bank funding costs, 
uh, what the consequences of those could be for uh, households and businesses, equally looking out for um, other, other risk factors. Mm. But we, you know, we have to remain incredibly vigilant. I, I, I would just uh, note that in terms of the government bond markets, um, you mentioned US Treasuries, you know, two of the big buyers, which were the Federal Reserve Bank and China, probably not buying as much as, as before. And uh, so I, I do uh, accept that you'll need to be vigilant on those risks. Um, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my questions are really going to focus on um, uh, whether Silicon Valley Bank was prepared or not, or how well prepared. So on Thursday the 9th of March, I think I'm right in saying that if your assessment of Silicon Valley Bank would be that it met all the regulatory requirements. What about UK? Yeah, UK, yeah. Silicon Valley Bank UK. Uh, it met all the regulatory requirements you'd expected of it. It was uh, well capitalised, it had the right liquidity coverage ratio, it was closely supervised by you, you had the information you needed about it, and yet it collapsed the following day. Uh, doesn't that suggest that your supervisory regime and criteria sim simply aren't fit for purpose? Well, let me start. I'm sure you know, some will probably want to come in. Uh, key point I'd make, I'll make two key points to you to start with. No subsidiary can be expected to survive the failure of its parent. I don't think that is a reasonable expectation. I mean, they're, they're, they're too tightly <coughs> associated and connected to, to do that. So. But I'm going to make another point. It's not always true. I mean, some subsidiaries would. But anyway, I'd look. I think it's, I think it's unusual, put it, yeah. put it that. I would not expect, I would not work on the basis of that yeah. expectation. Now, by the way, one of the, I think, the key things that was done, and it was done last summer, it took about two years to do, was that Silicon Valley Bank UK was a branch until then. Now, it, it passed through the point in our policy where you know, there's, a, there's a level of F FSCS protected deposits, and if they, if a branch goes, a foreign branch goes above that level, then we say yeah. you need to subsidiarise, and it did that. And I want to stress that because had it not done that, had we still had a branch on our hands, it would have been an altogether much more difficult situation. So that's important. We, we you know, was subsidiarised. The point I want to make, you said, you know, I said in response to you, well, no subsidiary will survive the failure of its parent, but that's not the end of the story because what we had. I think on our hands was a well capitalized subsidiary and it had strong liquidity as Sam's just said it you know it lost about 30 percent of its deposits in, in one, one day, day but it did have the cash cash buffers to, to, to meet those to meet those outflows now that's important because what it meant is that going into the weekend we were working with a bank that you know, there was a reasonable prospect that we could do something to, to resolve it, which would come out on the other side as it did with a, with a purchase. Frankly, if the bank's not solvent going into the weekend, that, that, that becomes you know, immeasurably harder. So, so I, you know, I would emphasize, I don't think you can expect subsidiaries. We should not work on the assumption that subsidiaries will survive the failure of their parents. But what we must do is have the subsidiary in a, you know, in a good state, so that when, when we then turn to resolution, we can do something with it. So uh, briefly, I think the team did a very good job of making sure that the UK subsidiary was capitalised, including on concentration risk um, and on interest rate risk. Um, but back to your, your original question, Look, there is a bit of a trade-off in these things. We could remove run risk from banks by requiring 100% outflow of all deposits to be held in reserves at the Bank of England. Um, but we're choosing not to do that. We do not want to operate a zero failure regime because there would be some significant costs in terms of availability of lending to the economy. And that's a trade-off that is made in all regulations. Having said that, I won't repeat what I said earlier, but I do think we've got to look back at these outflow rates in the LCR specifically and say, what have we learned from this? Also, in, in due course, what have they learned from the other banks in the States that we're not involved with? So is it, is it, as far as you're concerned at the moment, obviously it's only a couple of weeks, but it's, it's that outflow rate is the main thing. There's nothing else you'd need. I'm just trying to say, look, on Thursday you would have thought it's a totally healthy, yep. solid subsidiary. It collapses the next day. You know, what else is it that you'd need to know to be confident uh, that it really was healthy when it was actually on the verge of dropping dead? Well, I think there's the point that Andrew was referring to before, which is there are some differences between how the interest rate risk the banks carry is dealt with for smaller US banks and how we deal with it in our our system and um, um, my colleague in the Fed, Michael Barr, has has confirmed that he's going to bring forward some proposals about how they run uh, that part of U.S. regulation. Actually, they're going to do that pretty quickly. I think by the first of May, 
Um, but the three main distinctions are, one is that the, the accounting is different and that US GAAP is much more accommodating of what's called hold to maturity. Yeah. Um, secondly, the way that um, smaller firms, but quite large banks in our terms in the US, uh, are allowed to deal with of the remaining part of their bond portfolios, which are available for sale from a capital point of view, is different. So they have an exemption, they don't have to take those losses through to capital. That's an exemption they can choose to use. SVB US did use that. We don't allow that in our system. Uh, and thirdly, we capitalize very explicitly in what we call pillar 2A in minimum requirements, that risk. So I, look, having looked back through this episode, um, I think all of those things in our system are working fine. Our US colleagues, I think, have been doing a fantastic job, but they have said themselves they're going to look at how, how that works in their system. You've both uh, mentioned the concentration risk in, the, in Silicon Valley Bank because it was a narrow, narrow sector, uh, obviously, um, and you required extra capitalization for that. Are you, are you confident that you've measured the concentration risk right and that the, the cap, extra capital that it had uh, was sufficient for that because part of the reason why the run was so rapid was mm. that it was a small network group of people who, uh, uh, I mean, there's a few VC funds told all their clients to withdraw their money sort of instantly in a few WhatsApp messages, and uh, but also those clients, uh, certainly in a lot of cases, were required to hold their entire capital in Silicon Valley Bank, and so it's quite natural for them to uh, try and withdraw it as quickly as possible. So, did, had you measured the concentration properly, and were your uh, mitigations to capital sufficient? Well, I would say on the on the capital side, 100%. I feel completely confident about that. I've got no reason to to uh, question the way that was done. Um, but coming on to the liquidity side, um, as I say, the regime that we've got was implemented in full for this firm. As Andrew said, that it's actually quite interesting if you look at the balance sheet. What you can see is they're having to pay out the deposits with cash on that day. They're also having to sell some of their liquid assets. Uh, you can see about 700 million liquid assets. That'll work fine. Our problem was that we thought confidence had been lost in the institution overall because of what was happening at the parent so significantly that that wasn't going to be able to be sustained. And I do think we're going to need to come back, not particularly for this firm, but with that learning, also the point that the chair was making around the speed at which money can move and say, well, actually, have we got those outflow rates right? But, but I'd finish by saying, you don't want to cover that risk completely because the only way to cover it completely yeah, is to is. You know, go the route that I just described. So you'll always have a judgment there, but I think we should revisit, question that judgment based on what we've learned. Yeah. So certainly in the US, and I, th I believe in the UK as well, though I might be wrong, but the, the Silicon Valley Bank often required its clients to hold all their capital with them rather than elsewhere. And I certainly know, I've spoken to uh, tech firms who are customers of Silicon Valley Bank, they wanted their banking facilities. Uh, and they were required to hold all their capital there. And they, so they hadn't tried to diversify. You've got 100 million pounds, you don't normally hold it all in one bank, you try and put it in a range of institutions to make sure that if something like this does happen, you don't, you don't face wiping out. Is that, um, that restrictive practice that uh, SVB have? I know it's been subject to commentary in the US. Do you, does that cause concern for you as a, as a regulator? Well, I think um, to the extent it exacerbates run risk, I think that's why we'd really worry about it. On the asset side, from a capital point of view, I think that's a commercial choice that can be made. Um, and we just need to make sure we've captured it properly in our requirements, which, which I think we have. I would say that that arrangement, I think, was quite unusual. Um, uh, but it, like for you, it was very striking to me that, and of course, we had a huge amount of inbound over the weekend that we're talking about from firms, that many firms did find themselves in this very concentrated um, position so and, and that exacerbated their exposure. I mean, sorry, I was going to say another point that I, th you know, I think we will naturally have to look at, uh, but it's a broader point, it's not, not just a regulation point, is that something that businesses say to me, and, and actually, I mean, particularly startup businesses, but it's not just startup businesses, that opening, you know, m many business accounts with, uh, to, to get a sort of diversified range of banks is not easy yeah. to do. So I think there is a point there. And the ease of account opening for businesses. Can I just ask, in your, in your opinion, I, I, do, do you think that it, do, having that concentration of your capital in one bank, do you think that, and a policy like that, do you think it does exacerbate run risk? Because the, the clients face complete wiping out as opposed to just losing a portion of their money. Um, look, I think when you've got a combination of individual firms very concentrated, so they haven't diversified themselves, and that client base itself also being very concentrated, I think you can see how that could lead to a higher, mm. higher run risk. I think that is one of the learnings from this. And very tech savvy. Very tech savvy. Yes. So, yeah. you know, 
already using the kind of um, messaging and the like for for more conventional messaging that then you know you can really go on it when you're in when you're in a run situation. I'll just say, not ask a question, just make a point. I think it'd be good uh, for you to look at whether and the point that Andrew made about it's difficult for companies to open multiple bank accounts, mm. whether that should be something you look at, because it's clearly a lot more stable from, a, from mm. an economic stability mm. point mm -hmm. of view if companies are encouraged, allowed, to <laughs> facilitated to have multiple bank accounts where the deposits are, rather than holding all, their, all the yeah. VC money they raise in one firm, which is mm. high, clearly mm. high risk economically. Right. Thank you, Anthony. Mm. John. Thank you, Chair. May I just briefly turn to the bank's approach to resolving um, the SVB mm. UK issue, its interaction with the Treasury, and what alternative um, options were being considered. Um, on the 10th, Friday the 10th, the bank published a statement that said that you intended to um, place SVB UK into a bank insolvency procedure. Um, your subsequent letter to us, went on to say that a sale would better promote public confidence and stability of the UK financial system. So I suppose my question to Dave, if I may, is what caused you or the bank to change course and pursue a sale of SVB UK instead? Mm. And if a sale was going to be the better outcome, why weren't you pursuing that in the first place? Well, uh, oh, I mean, when we are starting, they will come in. Mm. Can I make a cr crucial point here? We could not guarantee that a sale would take place until around about, probably around about 4 a.m. Sunday, Sunday morning going into Monday. So yeah, Monday yeah, morning. Mo Monday morning, sorry. Yeah. Monday morning, um, yeah. The reason we said what we said on Friday evening was, was really three points to it. First, I mean, the, the, the bank insolvency procedure is the standard procedure for smaller banks. We know that we can execute that procedure over a weekend, so we can give certainty that there is a solution that we can execute. Mm. And that's important. It was important for two reasons. One is to give certainty that we can do that. The second was to make the very clear statement that goes with that, that this bank was not, in our view, a, a systemic risk to the financial stability. And that's critically important. We had to draw a line and say, this is not, you know, this is not a bigger problem. Mm. Mm. The third thing is that, in effect, that statement then puts the bank up for sale. And yeah. Now, we have quite a lot of tools that we can use in the resolution toolkit. We made a, 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 an important, there was an important statement in that, or important form of words in that statement, which is, you know, if, you know, if further information came to light, we would act upon it. And, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, you know, we then went into a process over the weekend. A sale option became you know, a clear possibility, and then went beyond that. And we were then able to reconsider the resolution objectives from the point of view of you know, what would deliver the best outcome for our objectives. And once we knew that we had a sale that we could do, then mm. we concluded that was the better option. Yeah. And but on Friday evening, we couldn't say that. No. And, and, and we, you know, we, we have a <coughs> preferred resolution strategy for every institution that we're responsible for. And the one for SVB UK was bank insolvency procedure. And for all the reasons Andrew gives, it, it made sense to clearly give that signal on Friday evening with, with as Andrew says, the phrase, um, absent any meaningful further information. For me, I think of it as a, what, what, you're, what you're doing by announcing that is you've got a credible counterfactual that you can then assess the yes. alternative options that come along uh, over the weekend, hopefully, you know, you can't guarantee it, that you can assess against an option you know you can deliver. Yes, as the, I suppose as what you're saying is, is that you need to ensure that you get the message out of, of one of confidence and stability yeah, yeah. whilst leaving the door open. Exactly. To possible options. So I get that, I get that. Can you... Can you just perhaps then explain the role of the Treasury in all of this? Because we saw the transfer statement a few days later. Um, to what extent did the Treasury bring pressure to bear with regards to, you know, the preferred option of a sale? Um, and I, within that, um, can I perhaps want to explore further whether there was a little bit, in the nicest possible way of ignorance, as to the importance of the customer base to the UK economy? 
Uh, it does feel, through subsequent actions and the involvement of the Economic Secretary, when he said, subsequent emerging developments made clear the risks to the firm's customer base, in particular those in the technology and life sciences sectors, um, meant that there was a public interest in ensuring uncovered depositors, etc., etc. I mean, I suppose I'm asking, to what ex if you could just take us through the interaction with the Treasury, and with that, give us some sort of flavour as to whether the nature of the customer base, the UK customer base, was a factor in the bank's decision making? Well, I would start by saying it's not just the Treasury that would prefer a sale, we would prefer a sale, it's a better outcome. Um, so if we, can, you know, if we can affect a sale, we would always do that. Yeah. Um, and you know, fortunately in this case we did. So that's always our preference. Secondly, we work very closely with the Treasury. The Act, if you, you know, if you go through the Act, the Act actually sets out a, a, you know, a pretty tight relationship between us and the Treasury on this, and that's important. Um, it's important for several reasons. I mean, you know, there is always a, you know, a risk that there might need to be a, a bigger public intervention. It wasn't the case here, but there is a risk. So we followed through on that. I, I mean, I think the point, I think you make a very interesting point about the sort of the technology and life sciences yeah. sector. And I, you know, I think it's important as well, so please don't in any sense think we don't agree with that point. What I would draw a distinction, and I think this is an important distinction, is that the judgment we had to make on Friday evening was about the stability of the financial system and, and financial stability. Um, I know, you know, I was criticised in some course saying, well, you don't understand systemic stability because there's another system out there which is the, you know, the tech and the life sciences system. No, I do understand that. Um, we had to make a particular judgment on, you know, according to our powers. But of course, yes, if we could, if we could, as, as we managed to do, affect a sale that preserved continuity of banking for these, you know, these important businesses, we'll do it. Okay. And can, can I? Can just, I, I, I just wanted to. There are two. It's really important that we're kind of open and transparent. I think about the relationship between the authorities, and the the Banking Act is very clear. And then. In, in the form with which we exercise our resolution, resolution tools through the resolution conditions assessment mm. that we have to make. The role of the Treasury is very clear. Now, we're responsible for um, deciding on the tool unless there is a risk to public funds where absolutely it is right yeah. that the Treasury should lead on that. Um, no, because, I you know, I we, and, and I think that's a really important um, way to frame okay. things. We can give kind of technocratic advice and make assessments, but where public funds come into play, yep. and so that's why we involve the Treasury as appropriate, through, as we did on the Friday evening on the resolution conditions assessment that got us to the bank insolvency procedure, then in the early hours on the Monday morning Fine. that affected uh, the resolution Final that we question, ended up if doing. I may, though, can I just press you on the nature of the customer base? Um, this is deemed to be a high growth area for the UK. It's a deemed to be an area where we have world leaders across the spectrum, an important part of the economy, if you like, for the future. I mean, to what extent was that a factor in your decision, ultimately, your preferred option, to take the preferred option of actually a sale to a bank like HSBC? It, it, it wasn't in the sense that if, if we can sell a bank over a weekend, we'll sell a bank. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really matter what its customer base is because mm -hmm. that's a better outcome for the customers. Um, so it, it, didn't, it didn't make the difference in that sense. What I would say, however, is that given, obviously, as you say, the important nature of the, of the customer base and the wider importance of the economy, I'm very pleased that we were able to do it. Yeah. Okay. But, but we're Thank always you. conscious of the depositor base and you know particularly if there are going to be uncovered depositors we'll you know we we're, we're conscious of the context we're trying to sell a bank don't have to do it very often as it happens we haven't done a resolution yeah. since 2011 um, which actually in that case the South Sea case was it was a bank insolvency procedure but we'll all at the Bank of England will be might you know we'll be aware but that's why we have to consult also with the financial services compensation scheme but it's not a kind of, it's not a crucial factor for us in exercising our powers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Angela. So really you're saying that the bank insolvency procedure, Governor, is the backstop, the sort of thing, banks. the counterfactual. For small banks. Um, for small, for small bank. banks, yeah. yes. And we're talking about a small bank yeah. here. And so you put that backstop in on the Friday, 
and then presumably spent the weekend hunting round for better options? Well, well actually, we spent the weekend work, making sure that we could then deliver yeah. on that backstop. It's really important to understand that when you're going through even with a small bank, a resolution weekend is, is going to have lots of twists and turns in it. So you have to, for it to be a credible counterfactual, you have to be able to deliver that on the, on the Monday. So you have to you know, get an insolvency practitioner sorted out, have all the engagement, you know, all the engagement with the firm to ensure that all the, yeah. all the wire, you know, you're not gonna get any wires crossed. Equally then, alongside that, you'll be running uh, you know, you'll, you'll be looking for a purchaser. Um, and, and that's just the nature of a resolution. That you, we've got multiple tools, and we, as we set out in our letter to you, you know, the, the choice of tools, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be wanting to have more than one in play, and then where you end up will depend on the circumstances of the particular resolution. I, I mean, we had the, the Bank Insolvency Procedure team was working on that process until 4 a.m. on Monday morning. Because, we because can any sale yeah. can fall through at the last yeah. minute. Well, I, I've, I, I've done a resolution in the past. I actually, well, it's a firm that had a UK presence which fell through at about 3am 3, 3 on Monday morning. Yeah. And in, in which case, if you don't then go for an insolvency procedure, you might fall back on a bridge bank. Yeah. Yeah, so you've, you're, you, you've got, you, you need to have multiple options. And that's the great thing about the resolution regime, that it, compared to where we were, when I was you know, I it well. in the Treasury, where the only two options we had during the global financial crisis were either you allow the bank to fail and risk financial stability, or you get a bailout yeah. from public funds, which comes back to the, the answer I gave you, uh, Mr. Barron. Were there other banks other than HSBC that were um, sniffing around as potential buyers? Because it's quite a big book of companies that although some of them are risky they may grow um, and and HSBC got it for a pound were there a few other pe uh, so banks in Silicon Valley Bank UK uh, set up a so-called data room uh, they hired advisors and um, throughout uh, from sort of late Saturday throughout Sunday that data room was open and quite a, you know, quite a few people came into that data room to have a look there were a number of uh, possible offers, but yeah, I've, I've had quite a lot of experience of doing these things. You know, most of them don't turn into anything real, and then occasionally you get ones where they set conditions and you say, "No, sorry, we can't do that." Um, so by the end of that process, and by that I mean sort of really sort of into the into the sort of earlier part of the evening on Sunday. So this is around sort of seven, eight o'clock on Sunday evening. We really only had one left, and that was HSBC. And um, what uh, what due diligence guarantees did they do on the book? Did they do all of that over the weekend? Well, they yeah, they, so so. As Andrew said, it was clear to us that in that early evening of Sunday, we needed to narrow down the sale option to to one based on on what we had at that point. So in terms of just getting to the line by seven in the morning. Um, uh, HSBC can speak for themselves, but they went into the data room. Um, they, this was you know, an extraordinarily high pressure situation with lots of us working both nights over the weekend. Yeah. Um, and HSBC therefore didn't have much time to your question, but they did have some time. Uh, they did a lot of due diligence very intensively and they prepared their teams during the Sunday. And then there were further yards of that that had to be done late into Sunday night and early into Monday morning, which is why of course we had to keep the other options going in case something emerged from that. Having said all that, um, there was a risk judgment that HSBC had to make around did this look attractive enough commercially that they were happy to run the risk of doing something at a much higher speed than they would normally choose to do? And in, sure. in the end, the answer to that question was yes. Um, um, but, but, but you, I mean, there were quid pro quos, weren't there, which were, I mean, we had the statutory instrument yesterday which changed the um, ring fencing regime. So there are quid pro quos here, presumably, to give them comfort. Well, there were only, uh, this was an important part, by the way, of why HSBC was a credible billet, bit of the push, is that they only really asked for two things. One was change of control approval, so they're not allowed to take it over unless we agree. Um, and the second was around ring fencing. Uh, do you want to go into that now? I, can I think there are, uh, uh, as a colleague of mine will be asking about the okay, detail, I'll, but, I'll, but, I'll, but did, they, did they suggest changes to the ring fence? That they were clear, and we'll perhaps come on to this, colleague's going to go, yeah. they were very clear that a necessary condition for them 
uh, was that some, some analysis made there. And, and if I can just add to your point about the valuation, in the time available, we carried out an independent internal valuation. I mean, as in we did the valuation, um, uh, as opposed to anyone else doing it, um, of, of what, you know, under stress circumstances, what the bank was worth. And that's what, you know, that's what led to the, 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 the share transfer and taking place at a value of a pound, because we had to mark down um, the balance sheet very significantly. I, I was only going to add, it sort of goes back to uh, Mr. Brown's question, that Sam made the point that, of course, they were still having to make a judgment on the value of the assets. That judgment is easier because there was capital, you know, the bank had capital. Yeah. And it's much easier to make that judgment than if it doesn't have capital. Mm. And that, 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 that capital, as well as the regulatory, and, you know, all the capital was owned by the parent, which was also, yeah. you know, from our perspective, it made it very straightforward. And uh, the, I suppose the, the, the other issue is, um, going forward for smaller banks, does the insolvency procedure, is it a viable option? Um, and therefore, does it have teeth? as a part of your toolbox because clearly you, you're anxious to avoid it. What would have been the outcome had it, had this bank had to go into the insolvency procedure? Had HSBC got cold feet and run away at 3am on, um, yeah. on, on Monday morning? Well, I, what would you have been left with? Well, I think it is a viable procedure. We've used, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, Dave said earlier we've used it in the past. Um, what I think would have happened, well, what would have happened is that the insured deposits would have been paid out within seven days. Now, they're not a very, they were not a very big proportion of the total deposits, but they would have been paid out. The uninsured deposits would then have been paid out as the insolvency practitioners realised the value of the assets. I think there is a, you know, there is a very reasonable chance that they would have been paid out in full because of the capital base that the bank had. But you can't tell that for definitively and for, until it actually happens. I think, of course, the effect, and this goes back to the effect on the on the businesses, on the um, biotech and fintech businesses, of course, is that even though they you know, had, there was a reasonable prospect they'd have been paid out in full, they would have had to wait for that to happen. So it would have been a great period. That's the crucial safe. point, I think, that yeah. from the point of view of the liquidity of those businesses, mm -hmm. yeah. they would have seen a very a, a very substantial effect. Particularly for payroll on Monday. Yes, morning. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about what. Um, the US uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is having to do with its management of the parent. You know, it's now involved in a in a bridge bank set up. Yeah, it's and guaranteed the entire but, the but, entirety of the deposits with no it, loss at all. But it's also Plus managing generous to generous bonuses, I think. But it is good. also managing. You know, I think yesterday was announced that it had managed to sell some of the book to another bank. So it's working no. through uh, the balance sheet in that way, and we, you know, we if we'd gone down the bridge bank route, we would have been in that position. But just to reinforce Andrew's point, I think absolutely, you know, we need the bank insolvency procedure as as one of the three potential strategies, along with partial transfer and bail-in, that how we approach it. The banks that you know that we're the resolution authority for it, it's it, it's still an important. Well, element. The key issue is who bears the cost. Yeah. yeah. Now, I think in this case, because the bank had capital, as I was just saying a moment ago, it may have been there wouldn't be a cost, but there would have been a cost in terms of liquidity for, for the for the firms. But the key issue here is who bears the cost in the in the bank insolvency process. It's the uninsured deposits that are you know standing in line effectively after you've taken out whatever's left on the capital and. Uh, side, but let's assume there isn't for a moment. Um, if you go to the big banks, we've put in place so-called bail-in regimes where they issue debt that, yeah, that can be bailed in to bear the losses, uh, to recapitalise the bank. Uh, but in the, in the bank insolvency procedure, I mean, that is the key point is that the losses would more likely fall through into the uninsured deposits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Siobhan. Oh, thank you. Um, could I ask you... Uh, um, Mr. Bailey, existing legislation already makes Silicon Valley Bank exempt from ring fencing rules uh, for four years after its resolution. What do you make of the government's intention to make this exemption permanent? Would you mind if, I mean, Sam's the expert on ring fencing, would you? Oh, happy? Yeah. Well, that's a bold claim, but I, I am keen on it. I'm going to make that um, claim. <laughs> um, 
Perhaps so, he just didn't want to answer the question. No, no, so he'd have been, he'd been happy to be. He, he knows I'm a great enthusiast for the ring fence. Um, uh, there are three <laughs> bits of it. Of um, so, so the one is that um, Parliament, uh, very wisely in drafting the Banking Act, has allowed for a four-year exemption. That thinking about exactly this kind of a situation, mm. where a ring fence bank is buying another bank in a distress situation or resolution situation, and that gives the other bank four years to come into line with ring fencing legislation. Nothing had to be done to make that happen, that just automatically followed, just as you said. Um, a second thing which did need to be done very urgently, given the situation we were in, was that it was important that on the Monday morning at 7 a.m., um, uh, HSBC was able to fund Silicon Valley Bank UK without restriction, because we were in the middle of this very high-speed run, and of course we thought the sale would rebuild confidence, but there can be a lag effect. So the Treasury needed to lay a Section 75 order, which I think actually was just debated in the um, uh, I think you're referring to the Delegated Rules yeah, Committee yeah. yesterday, yeah. Um, which was just to allow them to lend freely, because that's obviously not an arm's length type of transaction. The, the third piece um, is more directly on what you're asking about, which is that the, the Treasury uh, has agreed to make a permanent exemption uh, for SVB UK within HSBC uh, UK within the... But did they group. do that because they were desperate for somebody to take the bank and were happy to cave into HSBC's demands? Well, look, I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you what their rationale was and give you my view on it. Um, as I said, it, HSBC did not seek many things in this transaction, but they were absolutely clear that a necessary condition of them being willing to go forward was that they could keep the entirety of SPV UK as one business because they thought that the, the integrated nature of the business was part of the value they were getting and they could only make the numbers work if they had it as a subsidiary of HSBC UK. So, so the, the Treasury faced a trade-off there. Um, do they agree to make you know, a very small hole in the ring fence permanently in order to get this one over the line to serve the wider objectives that we were looking to achieve over the weekend? Uh, or do they not? And they decided that they should. For what it's worth, I think there's a good call. Um, I probably am one of the very last people on earth who would support punching any kind of a hole in the ring fence. But this is very, very small in relation to HSBC. If I might just make one more comment, though, I think something that we should be alert to is um, I think it would be a very bad thing if other banks sought to say that because this had happened in this one case, that needed to be generalised for everyone in business as usual. You, you might face the same situation again in a stress takeover mm. like this, in which case you might have to think about it. But I, I can see an argument might come to say, oh, because that little hole is made, everyone's got to have that little hole. Isn't that, that almost inevitable? I, I, it may be inevitable, but if it comes, I think we should resist it. There is a big distinction, I think, between a stress event and... The, you know the kind of environment that we think we're going to be going into that you know the the ski op review was thinking about you know this is a reminder that stressed events happens and and that banks fail so i think it's really important that we have a ring fencing regime that that can that works yeah. in good times as well as no. bad i mean there's another piece of it might come to which is it's important that when th that that order has not yet been brought forward to the house it will be i think debated um it's important, of course, that the that permanent exemption is suitably limited, both in terms of size and in terms of the shape of the business. Because what you obviously mm. wouldn't want to do is say, okay, well, we, we've allowed this very, very small hole in the fence, and you turn around, it's suddenly a massive one. So um, that'll be an important part of it. Is that mm. how holes normally happen? <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends on the robustness of the rest of the fence, and, and <laughs> hole that's made it very robust, I think it'll be okay. Uh, what proportion of Silicon Valley Bank's business would not ordinarily be allowed to be undertaken by a ring fence bank? It would be, I can't give you a precise percentage, but it would be quite significant for the reason that um, uh, a certain amount of the lending, quite a significant portion of the book actually, is in the form of subscription finance, which is basically to bridge um, uh, the investors in venture funds between making the commitment to put money in and actually having the money available. Um, those clients in that case will, will often be, I think, relevant financial institutions for the purposes of ring fencing, which means that ring fence banks can't normally lend to them. Um, so I think it would be quite significant, which is why um, it was a red line for HSBC, I think, and that was why it was quite credible that it was a red line for them. Um, are there any uh, wider potential or comp competition risks from these exemptions? For example, do they provide scope for HSBC to take on additional business that it would be previously have not been able to or allowed to? 
Well, I think that comes to the limitations. Mm. So if you look at the size of SBB UK today, I mean, it's sort of a 10 billion balance sheet. Uh, HSBC is $3 trillion globally. I really don't think that that presents a risk to them. It could be somewhat larger. It still wouldn't represent a risk. Um, but I think those limits are important. But I think the wider risk is the one we were touching on a moment ago, which is if somehow this is preyed in aid mm. of other kind of business as usual things, that, that I think is where you could have a problem. I kind of said, I mean, I, I do think it's important, it sort of goes back to Mr. Barron's question, actually. I mean, I do think it's important that the larger banks in this country do provide support for, um, you know, high tech, biotech in industries. I mean, you know, it, you know, we need to have them in that market, as it were, yeah. to support these, you know, these really important and growing uh, firms we have in this country. So I think the fact that I think HSBC Tootsie also took a decision that they actually wanted to get into this business. Yeah. Um, you know, now, obviously, they've got to prove they can do it, but it's a good thing. Yeah, I think it was all, it, it aligned with what they were already thinking about strategically. Mm. It obviously came along as an opportunity mm. in a stress situation, but it but should be part of the, the, the If the it's good for approach. HSBC and we want um, our large banks to lend to precisely the type of uh, companies that Silicon Valley Bank did, why would it not be good for all the other bigger banks mm. could they not reasonably say well, think, we'd like access to mm. this market too so mm. please think, do something um do something for us i think it comes back to a point sam made a few minutes ago about the question about is it necessary for them to have both sides of the balance sheets mm. on the, in the same legal entity or not i think that's actually a crucial question because that's where the ring fence in a sense, creates the restriction. They can clearly do that both sides of the business, but the ring fencing regime would require them to have one side of the business in the one side of the fence and the other side on the other side of the fence. Now, I think in the context of key skiops review, you can probably have that debate. I think that's a you know, sensible debate to have. I think Sam has very, very wisely set out why we don't want the whole to become bigger uh, you know, by not you know, by not thinking about it. But I think it's a perfectly reasonable debate to have because there was quite an extensive debate about small firms uh, in the context of the ring fence when the ring fence was, uh, was first put in place. Thank you, Chair. You had one question on yeah, ring just, fencing. Isn't it the case that allowing a <coughs> tiny hole to be punched in the ring fence starts a precedent that basically means next time there's a problem, a bank that's fancies buying that for a pound is going to that negotiation that precedent is set isn't it simply undermining the whole basis of the ring fence so look, I think what I say that is life is not perfect you have to make trade-offs sometimes um, I do think it is possible that if we found ourselves in exactly the same situation again with a non ring fenced entity very small uh, big bank offering to take it over with making the same condition. I, I, I think you're right. It, it, it's quite possible one might have to consider that. And I think one should have an open mind to that. It's not something one would want to do in normal circumstances. But I, I could imagine the calculus being the same. So I think we have to be open to that. But what I think we should resist is the idea that other people come along and just sort of kick lots of little mm. holes in the fence you know, without that very extreme kind of urgency mm. that you had in this situation. Because, I mean, just to... Yeah. Ju because it is worth going back to the, you know, we, we hope, we, you know, we have a fit and ready resolution regime, but we, you know, the, the key thing is that through the work that, that Sam leads on, that we don't find ourselves having to use it um, unless we really have to. This is the first time we've used it in 12 years. So hopefully this precedent that I think you're right to flag and which Sam has responded on is something that is you know this is not a repeated event obviously we can't rule out other resolutions they will happen but we're not thinking that there's going to be like you know a couple of resolutions a month that we're then going to be this precedent is going to become more apparent okay see you coming Emma um, thank you and um, and uh, thank you all of you for your uh, work in this it must have been quite a difficult week or so for you all and 4am finish is never ideal so thank you um, the demise of Credit Suisse looks like a bit of a car crash in slow motion. Should the regulators have taken greater steps earlier to prevent this smash? Well, I, I think, I have to be honest, we can't speak for the Swiss regulators. It's, it's a Swiss bank, obviously, and the, the, the home regulator is a, is a Swiss regulator. We have quite a large operation in this country, and we have taken over a long period of time, a lot of steps to make sure that that UK operation was properly set up and, and, and insulated as best we could in the event of a problem. 
I mean, sadly, I'm afraid that you're right. I think Credit Suisse has had problems going back over a long period of time. Uh, it's, it's managed to stack up a lot of problems uh, over time. And I think, the, I think that the real question, I think, with Credit Suisse in the end was not actually solvency in a sort of very, very sort of per se sense. It was actually the viability of the bank going forwards, given the, given the sort of severe sort of business model restructuring that the chief executive had identified needed to take place. Combined with, I would say, two other things. One was the emergence of some particular problems uh, over, in fact, over the weekend of the uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, mm. action. We were, actually, we were actually having to do both together at one stage, um, particularly to do with the US securities regulator identifying problems in the context of their um, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance in the US. Um, the second thing, obviously, then subsequently, a couple of days later, its major shareholder indicated that it was not going to provide more support mm, for it. So mm. that is obviously a critical, critical blow for any firm. And then, of course, I think you have to say well, there was, of course, while, the, while the, the proximate causes of the, of the Silicon Valley problem in the US and the Credit Suisse problem are different, there was a coincidence of timing and there was a lot of stress in the market. And so a bank that had been in long run, uh, if you like, sort of viability challenge came to this sort of crescendo at that moment. We, I mean, so, you know, we have taken a lot of steps over the years uh, to get in place, you know, the UK operation into a place where we thought we could deal with it if we needed to deal with it. Mm. Um, and, and so that has been very high priority for us going back, you know, a decade almost, I would say. Have there been any lessons from international regulatory cooperation about the failure of this, that, that potentially that you've learned or ideas about how things could have gone better and I thought it was really interesting when I was reading about this that it was saying that the bank had plenty of capital, plenty of liquidity but it had an issue around its culture. I thought that was well, unusual. It's had a whole series of problems over the years. Can I just say, when we say it had plenty of liquidity, it was experiencing a run. Right. Um, I, mean, yeah. I mean, we have okay. to be very clear on this, um, that it was experiencing a run. And I think, if you don't mind saying something, this is, this is a very interesting question. People often say to me when banks have problems, well, was it solvency or was it liquidity? And the answer, I'm afraid, isn't that simple. Um, it, it certainly had, you know, had a strong capital ratio. But you have to ask the question, why were the depositors leaving in that case? Um, mm. And what I think it pointed to was certainly a, a, what I call a viability problem going forwards, which meant that there was a loss of confidence by its depositors in its future viability. That's the thing. So solvency position is helpful and important, but it doesn't end the story at that point. And to what extent was the UK part of it as troubled as its Swiss parent? Or was it, mm. was it not as troubled? So I think the way for you to think about Credit Suisse in, in this instance is that three-legged stool. There's the, the, the parent and also a Swiss bank in Switzerland, and then there are, there's a major operation here in the UK, and there's also a big operation in the US. And throughout the period, particularly from October forward, it was a very intensive discussion at all levels between the Fed, FINRA and ourselves, including very regular calls between um, myself and my office and numbers in those two institutions, including, as Andrew said, over the weekend that we were dealing with the Silicon Valley, we were also in touch. Um, and I actually think that that worked pretty well. Um, and those discussions are about, first of all, what's the life situation with the firm and how are we managing the risks that there are there. Secondly, about a lot of contingency planning, including some of Dave's team, about, okay, what are we going to do if it comes to the crunch? Yeah. And um, that was extremely helpful when it came to that weekend because it meant, a bit like with Silicon Valley, none of the options are that appealing, but you have got options. Yeah, I mean, you probably just add, we've been contingency planning, again, as Sam says, since last autumn. So engaging both with the Swiss authorities, but also with the FDIC in the uh, US. And we'd had <coughs> meetings of the crisis management group, which is kind of cross-authority, you know, of the, 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 the authorities represented in the, the three-legged stool, as Sam calls it, you know, in the run-up to the events of March. So we were again, making sure that we were ready in contingency planning terms for whatever was going to play out. And then, as Andrew says, the crescendo played out in a particular way. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we, we all know what the, what the outcome is today. And so I suppose what I'm really keen to sort of dig into is the lessons learned, but also the possible impact this could have on the UK banking system or the future of... Uh, 
the UK part of Credit Suisse. So I'm kind of keen to know sort of are we to expect any any more concerns? Are we to expect any more issues? Are there things that could have been done being done differently? Are there any other banks you're concerned about and kind of really how it's impacting the UK? That's what I want to Well, know. I mean, on, on Credit Suisse in the UK, I would say that both the PRA and the FCA, and I can sort of speak for both going backwards, have, have frankly taken a lot of actions over the years with this firm to, ex you know, to require cleanups to take place. Um, and I think that has put it in a place where, certainly from the point of view of the sort of what happens next, the UK entities are in, you know, are in good order in that sense. And obviously, it's up to UBS now to decide mm. you know, what they what they will do with those operations. Not for us to decide what to do. It's up for UBS to decide what to do with those operations. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of actions and planning over the years have had, you know not only the need to, to take action at the time, but had this outcome in mind. What would we do if we got to this yeah. point? I think if I could just add briefly, I mean, our overwhelming priority in these situations is to avoid a disorderly collapse. Yes. Uh, that's what you want to avoid, because that would obviously have very big ramifications in the financial system, and because we have yeah. a big financial centre here, it would, it would affect yeah. us. And that, that's what all the planning was for. And you know, there was the resolution side of it, which was absolutely ready to go. There was also always, of course, the possibility that the Swiss would find some other structure through which to deal with the situation, which in, in the end they did. Just some, just further to the questions from my, my uh, co uh, colleague and friend Siobhan, do you think it's the government is right to push ahead with uh, ring fencing reform in light of this turbulence in the banking sector? So look, I, I, we talked about it a bit last time. I think um, there are all those recommendations that Keith Skiop made, which are sensible tweaks to the regime to make it work a bit better without reducing its effectiveness, and I really think they are fine. The, the two I think we need to keep an eye on, what, one is the the proposition, which is in principle a perfectly sensible one, of course, which is that if you've got a bank which is north of the ring fence threshold in terms of how much deposits it has, but doesn't do any investment banking at all, or any tiny, tiny bit, you know, could they be allowed not to have the regime? I think that's not a crazy proposition of itself, but there are some definitional issues, because you wouldn't want to have a situation where you had a UK entity that was north of the threshold and only to retail banking, but it's part of a much wider group. There's lots of investment right. banking that gets a pass. Mm -hmm. So we need to watch that one. And the other one, which the government uh, is taking further evidence on, uh, is the, the question that um, Sir Keith and his team raised as to whether there might come a point where if, if banks are resolvable, um, they can be removed from the ring facts. And yeah, my, my view on that is, um, at least for the moment, that um, it's a bit of a, a misthink in the sense right. that for those banks with a ring fence, it's integral to the resolvability yeah. of those banks. So they're complements, not substitutes. And I think all of these experiences we've been having, Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse as well, they're very difficult situations, but it's been, been very clear to me that there are a series of options you have, but also that you wouldn't want to rely on any one tool. So you need to have various things, ring fencing, bail-in, private sector purchase, and, and that's what you need as you go into these situations. But I, I can understand, I think it's also important that that sort of thinking process that it's, I don't think it's right to think of a bank as resolvable for all time. Yeah. Yeah, the world moves on and things change and you have to keep coming back to this resolvability assessment judgment. So just quickly then, would you prefer if the government paused its ring fence reform during this turbulent, slightly difficult time? I'm actually quite content for it to go ahead. I, I think it's fine. I just think we yeah. should keep a careful eye on the bits that could potentially weaken the regime. But I think the, the rest of it are sensible you know, adjustments which I think should go ahead. And, and to be clear, what the government is doing um, is putting out, as Sam was saying, a further call for evidence on this interplay between resolvability and the ring fencing regime. But if I can just associate myself with, with Sam and Andrew's comments, you know, having both the resolution regime and then the ring fence gives you more options. And as we've tried to describe to you, that optionality if you're in a crisis situation is really important and then as Andrew says resolvability we, we did a resolvability um, first ran the resolvability assessment framework last year for the for the major eight banks uh, and pub did a big publication last June you know where we said that we thought we'd overcome the too big to fail problem got no attention at all of course because then the world was calm and no one was, you know, you weren't having evidence on that kind of thing. Um, I think you asked me about it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we need to keep doing those, 
those rafts, those resolvability assessment frameworks. So we did the first one after years of work and preparation in 2022. Got another one starting next year. Meanwhile, the government is go calling for evidence on the interplay between resolvability. So there'll be lots of opportunities for stakeholders to input to that call for evidence. Um, but I think we, we think that the events of recent times show how important that optionality can be, you know, w whether in the case of a Credit Suisse or whether in the case of a SVB UK. Thank you. Thank you. Rishnara. Thank you very much. Just to follow up on ring fencing, uh, Sir John Vickers said that um, uh, in my view, removing ring fencing would pose a very great risk to financial stability. Do you all agree with that? Yes. Great. Everybody agrees. Yes. No. He also then, this is in evidence to questions I asked in the session he came to, he also said that um, Sir Keith, the, the, there was something said in Sir Keith's, Sir, uh, Sir Keith's report and also in the Edinburgh reform pa reforms package announced by the government that while it is worth retaining ring fence for now, there might come a day when resolution can do the job instead. Uh, that is the wrong approach. Do you all agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I okay, what Sam just said. I think resolution and ring fencing are complements rather than alternatives. Uh, okay. Right. But so, to, so, I mean, it's quite a serious point that he's raising, isn't he, that we should all be uh, alert and mm. vigilant mm. about in terms yes. of where mm. the government's heading, it, uh, not least because of the recent turbulence, mm. it brings it into sharp focus. Um, the Chancellor is giving evidence tomorrow, so um, you know I, I think it's important. It will be important for us to to make sure that the the route that we go down in terms of tweaking uh, for improvement is one thing. Complement complementarity, a set of tools that you can use deploy is one thing, but quite another in terms of what the government has written in black and white, saying that Sir John Vickers is raising alarm bells about. But but to be I mean just to be clear on where the process is the, you know the government got the vicars of Sky got the skiok review yeah. and then the follow up in terms of this question of the you know what we consider to be the complementarity sure. between the two regimes that's a call for evidence so sure. the government's clear that there's a yeah. there's an opportunity for people to feed in yeah. all the relevant right. evidence well i'm a bit more skeptical with respect about where the government is on this and where you are so i we'd be really you know we want to make sure that that the experts' uh, opinions are mm. taken seriously, and the architects of ring fencing, um, you know, their, their, their well warnings are heeded by the government in the rush to um, to pursue reforms that uh, that may be problematic. That's all. I just, just want so so just wanted to put that on the record. Um, going on to um, Credit Suisse and the wider implications. Governor, were you surprised by the decision of Swiss, the Swiss authorities to provide some relief uh, to equity holders uh, of Credit Suisse, but to fully write down the more senior 81 debt holders? Well, I have to say, I don't know the, you know, we don't know all, this, all the circumstances and the situation that the Swiss authorities uh, faced. I mean, we know, we know quite a lot of it, but we don't know all of it. Um, there is, a, as I think Dave was saying earlier, there is a resolution plan for Credit Suisse, which is agreed internationally. That is, that is the backstop resolution plan. The Swiss then, as you can do, implemented something you know, in, ahead of that, as it were, instead of that. Yep. Now, what I would say is this. As I understand it, the Credit Suisse 81 bonds have a different contractual clause in them. Uh, to, I think, most other 81 bonds, and I can certainly tell you than, than 81 bonds issued by UK banks, in that they have a clause in which allows this contractual uh, wipeout, if you like, to take place under certain circumstances. I, I'm not going to go further than that because no doubt there will be lots of law cases in Switzerland sure. to challenge it, yeah. but that's my understanding okay. of it. And how important is, eight, is the 81 market for well, financial stability in the UK? Well, we, just to add, we were very clear um, on the Monday after the Swiss authorities made their announcement to set out very clearly the position with our eight, you know, with the yeah. UK banks 81 bonds and how the creditor hierarchy would, would be preserved and maintained. It was very important, I think, for our market to set that out. 
And if I can just say, I mean, the reason, I'll, I'll be absolutely straightforward with you, the reason that our banks have not issued them goes back probably about a decade. And we did, in the best sense of the term, frown on some suggestions that it might be included because I do think, and I'll probably you know, take a different view on this, that it does complicate things because it makes the greater hierarchy more complicated and probably less intuitive. So we did not want our banks doing that. But I know Credit Suisse did it, and therefore it is a contractual, you know, it is a contractual provision, as I understand it, that they have. Sam, did you want to add anything? Well, just to say, the, the, the distinction Andrew is making is between this, the version of these bonds which converts into equity, yep. which, yep. as Andrew said, is almost entirely what we have in our market, <coughs> um, and these ones that wipe out. Because if you, if you have the wipeout ones, um, then in a sense you have a bit of inverted credit hierarchy yeah. built into the system because they are designed yeah. to wipe out while there's still some capital left in the bank. And we'd always thought the other version was more desirable for the hierarchy reason. Mm. And the statement that we made um, week yeah. last week on Monday, and indeed the Euro area authorities made a similar statement, was to emphasise that in a resolution one of the cardinal principles is that you stick to the credit to hierarchy. Now, I'm not saying the Swiss didn't do that because they had this different contractual provision, but we wanted to emphasise that you know, in any resolution we will always abide by the credit to hierarchy because that's a cardinal principle. As we did with the SVB yeah, really UK <laughs> resolution. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill Winters uh, of Standard Chartered um, Bank, the chief exec says, said, the big question is how do you wipe out $17 billion of 81 uh, in a solvent bank without a review process? Um, I think it has had very profound implications for the regulation of banks and for the way banks manage themselves. Do you think he has a point? Well, I think you have to come back to the fact that, you know, as I understand it, these 81 bonds had that contractual provision in their terms, and therefore I would assume that investors who bought them understood that that was the case. Um, and, and, of course, that was, that was the basis on which the, the Swiss acted. Is I think... Anyone else? Sorry, No, on. go on. No, keep going. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I think, obviously, you could see that it did cause a disturbance mm -hmm. in the 81 market, and, and that is why, in good part, we and the, we and the authorities in the uh, Euro system made the statement that we did, because we were very, very clear that we had to emphasise the uh, basis on which we would we have to treat them in any resolution to clear any, any confusion up over that. So you would agree with him, then? Well, I think the, the, the situation in Credit Suisse, I think, again, it's, it's, a matter for the, it's a matter for the Swiss authorities because it comes back to a point I made a few moments ago, which is they will have had to judge, looking forwards, the solvency and viability of the bank and what capital protection was required to affect the transaction with UBS. Rather, of course, as we have well, to do with, well, exactly. with Silicon Valley Bank UK, well, it, actually. Well, exactly, and that's a much bigger institution. Doesn't that set, set some alarm bells in terms of a pattern and a s series of chain, you know, the sort of things that can happen in terms of, in terms of how regulators then have to respond in, on a case-by-case -case basis? No, I would, if I might come in. Mm, I think, look, the, the bigger picture here is we had a very large international bank which had reached the end of the road in terms of its viability. Something had to be done. Something had to be done yep. that weekend for sure. Um, and in the end, the Swiss authorities found a way to stabilise the situation, which involved a purchaser. It involved some losses being taken by holders of um, the, the higher risk end of the yep. bond stack. Okay. And by the way, of course, you know, shareholders in Credit Suisse have had a pretty rough ride as well. Sorry, um, sorry. Shareholders, shareholders, shareholders have had a pretty yeah. rough ride as well. And look, I mean, I think we should expect that with the variety of our new tools, we ought to be able to take care of these situations short of a bailout, which is the answer we had last time around. And it does go back if you, to the question that the chair almost started with. You know, we were in a situation of, 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 of and, and as Andrew was just saying, of both overall volatility of markets, but also real volatility in particular segments, yeah. such as the 81 market. Things are, we, we remain very vigilant, yeah. um, we're, we're, we're certainly not complacent, but things are calmer than they were that, you know, that Monday. And you know, the pattern of previous, or well, certainly financial crises I've been involved in, is the way that things mushroom. 
um, you know, we, you know, and other things happen. But we I'm haven't just, seen. I'm, sure. we, we, I'm just trying to understand what your. I'm trying to understand whether you agree or disagree with this statement. I think it has very profound implications for the regulation of banks and for the way banks manage themselves. I mean, it can't be that difficult to just directly answer that question. Well, I, I, if you don't mind, one, I've great deal of respect for Bill Winston, but one point I would disagree with him on or challenge him on in, the, in what he wrote in that article is that I think he said the bank is solvent, but, it's, but in another part of the article, he questioned its viability. That you can't compartmentalise those two judgments. I mean, mm. they, they are part and parcel of the overall judgment. Mm. If a bank isn't viable, mm. yeah. then it, it might be solvent in sort of a, a sort of, you know, as of today, mm. in a sort of, you know, moment in time. But if you question its viability going forwards, then you're essentially yeah. questioning its solvency going forwards, actually. Right. Okay. And you have so to you say, so I'm, I'm if everybody saying, thought the bank was solvent, why, would, why was it having a run? I'm, I'm just trying Sorry, to get a straight um, answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, is, that's the challenge. Agree, I, I don't think it's as simple yeah. as, 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 Bill, as Bill sets it out yeah, to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sense. Just one final question. How much of the $17 billion uh, of credit Suisse say to on bonds were held in the UK? Well, I don't know. What I can tell you is that the SCA many years ago um, banned UK retail investors buying 81 bonds because they felt they were too complex. So they should not be in the retail sector in the UK. Can't say beyond yeah. that. I mean, it's the key thing for us to run down in these situations is what are the exposures of the UK yeah. banks and UK insurance companies, and they were minimal. But and the also, I mean, minimal. Yeah. Th you know, these are. Re these are quite complex, relatively sophisticated financial yeah. instruments. So you would imagine that the people who do hold them are, are, are aware of the risks, and, and you know that is also yeah. taken account of to some extent, some extent in the in the yields that they get on them. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the. Um, the, the, the moral hazard question, really, and, and I, I'm struck by the um, letter, Governor, that you sent us, suggesting that um, by ensuring, I'm going to quote, by ensuring that all deposits, including those not covered by the FC, FSCS, remain safe, secure, and accessible, the bank maintained public confidence in the stability of the UK financial system. Now you talk about the stability of the financial system, so it's not about the industrial sectors that the, that the bank supported, which I want to come on to. Mm. Um, and I don't think you're suggesting there was a contagion risk. We've discussed that. You seem to be suggesting that single banks should not fail, and specifically that uninsured depositors should not lose their share. No. That seems to be the implication. No, 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 well, no, no. well, if you're suggesting that the public uh, confidence in the stability of the financial system requires that deposits, including those not covered by the insurance scheme, remain safe, then you're suggesting that the financial system, the confidence in the financial system would have been harmed if uninsured depositors had been harmed. Well, but when, we, when we made the announcements on the BIP mm. on Friday evening, of course, that envisaged that there could be, there could be, going back to the point I made earlier about the capital base of the bank, there could be a loss to uninsured depositors. I think, I think the context that I you know, we've had in mind in making that, in, in making that, that comment was the position in the US. Now, I, mm. I perfectly understand what the US has done um, because we, were, we, we faced the same challenge in 2008, yeah. uh, as you may remember. Uh, and you know, it was a, it's a very difficult decision to make, but in the heat of the moment, there are times when you have to make that judgment. But I would agree with what I think Janet Yellen has said subsequently, is this is not a, a state of affairs that should be you know, the norm, yeah. that, that all deposits are, are, are guaranteed. Yes, okay. Um, so you're sympathetic, I mean we obviously took a different approach, but we can say that different circumstances perhaps. Very different, scale, very different scale of the bank and the, so on, but uh, and I appreciate you don't want to criticise another jurisdiction, but what is your, what, what, what can you just reflect, if you, I mean I've, you've discussed it before, but just reflect again a, a little on the, what you think of the actions of the US authorities and do you have concern that moral hazard has been introduced into the system where well, I, I, I would say that they had to take actions, you know, promptly and did so, because, you know, I have to say, we've, as I said a minute ago, we've been there ourselves. Mm. Um, you know, I know how bad these situations mm. uh, can be, and the decisions that you take at that time are the ones you have to take at that time to fit the times, and I think they did that, and so I would not wish to, in any sense, criticise them for that. 
Um, the question then is, you know, is how do you work, work the system out from there, I think, really, and what's the steady state going forwards? And I, I would not um, support, and I think this is exactly what Janet, Janet Yellen has said, um, the idea that a 100% deposit guarantee becomes a, you know, a norm. And do you think the communications in the US since the bailout have been, uh, have, have, have cr increased or decreased the general expectation that this would be repeated or that there is now an expectation of bailouts in the future? Do you think they've helped, helped to, they've exacerbated or dampened down well, that expectation? I, 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 I say, having been there, let me say this: it is a very, very difficult situation to have to handle because once you've put a, a deposit guarantee into place as a tool to ensure, frankly, that you calm things down and create some stability, stop runs happening. Of course, if you then go out and say, "Well, of course, you know, we're not going to continue this, and you know, we don't think it should should exist," you risk starting up the very run that you've just calmed down. So you don't want to do that. On the other hand, you do want to say as best you can, but this should not become the norm. And balancing those two things is remarkably hard. I've seen, had the experience, it is very hard to do. Yes, indeed. So I don't, for a moment, wish to criticise the US authorities. They've been dealing, I think, very well with a very difficult situation. Understood. Thank you. So back to the, back to the UK and what, what we've done. Uh, I mean, as we've been discussing, the, the Silicon Valley Bank UK supports a number of key sectors that, in our economy or in our future economy, and I wonder whether you agree that you know, the government appears unwilling to accept the depositors should, should lose and has worked hard with you to ensure that didn't happen in this case, uh, but do you think this is really just because it was a bank supporting these key industries? And I suppose I'm you know, aware that this is, a, this is a sector that, I mean, a lot of clever people, particularly in the US, you know, putting all their eggs in one broken basket, as it turned out. Um, but imagine if it was a in, in the, U, the UK arm was a, you know a regional bank supporting some unfashionable industry, you know, old-fashioned manufacturing or some kind of community, you know, a lot of community depositors and so on. Do you do you expect that you would have spent your weekends working hard to? Uh, save I've that had bank? to do it. So mm. I mean, let me tell you, I can tell you that when we had to do the resolution of the Dunfermline Building Society, those discussions about the regional nature of the of the business and the deposited base were exactly the ones I was having with the Treasury and the Chancellor at the time. So, yeah, it, it's, it, no, it, it happens. Okay. So it's simply on the case of the, the bank itself rather than the sector that it mm. supports. That, those, that's, your, that's your problem. And it comes okay. back to Andrew's mm. point earlier that you know, it's a, a question of where the cost will be bared. Yeah. And, or borne, sorry. And, in, you know, and, and so depending on the institution, you'll always be you'll always be alive to those considerations, but then you, you, in carrying out a resolution, you have to carry out a resolution that, that meets the overall resolution objectives. I mean, we, will, we, we keep this issue under review. I mean, I'll slightly oversimplify, but yeah, there is a contrast for the major banks, and we just discussed this with Credit Suisse, yet yeah, we insist that they issue, they issue more uh, loss-bearing debt. Mm. Uh, so they've got they've got the capital stack that Stan looks after, and they've got then they've got a, a resolution debt slice in their balance sheet that Dave looks after. The MRL, so yeah. that that can be yeah. bailed in, uh, and that that allows the bail-in to happen. Now, for the small banks, we don't do that. Um, it would be very difficult for the small banks to issue debt into the, they can't issue debt in the same way into the markets as large banks can. They're not big enough to do it. Um, and so that yeah, we do have different resolution approaches for the small banks, but I'm sure we'll have to come back and look at these things as part of what, the, come back to the earlier question, the lessons learned from this. And, and one thing, if I can just add, yeah. one agenda that we, that we have been looking at um, is can we improve depository um, outcomes in bank insolvency? Yeah, we're working with UK Finance on that. The, but, but, you know, th that, that's one thing in terms of speeding, um, speeding up uh, payments to in insured depositors. But you still have the issue that, as we discovered with SVB UK, many of these, many of the customers were businesses, they've got to provide payroll on a Monday. Mm -hmm. You've, you've got you've got real issues around their you know their continuity of business mm. that you know and it, that would be whether they were a tech firm or whether a manufacturing yeah. firm that you have to you have to think through mm. yeah 
I, I have a question or two on the small balance regime, but is, is Siobhan going to pick up the Edinburgh reports? No? Uh, no? Yes, we, um, we are uh, going on to Andrea now. Who's oh, going to Andrea. pick up that. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Over to you, Andrea. Sorry. Yeah. Not Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we all worked through the fallout of the last financial crisis, and I think the thing that stays with me is the heads I win, tails you lose approach of bankers. And so on a yes or no answer, are each of you content that it's reported that SBB and Credit Suisse will continue to pay bonuses to their staff? Are you content? Governor. Can I answer that with more than one word? Uh, no, I'd, I'd like a yes or no, and then you can have more than one word, but I'd like to know if you're content with that. I just can't answer the question, it says it's been one word, because I need to talk about which bit of the bank we're talking about. Okay, so, well, so let, SVB let, UK let, is, is the bit that's directly within our base. Okay, but let, let me ask it yeah. in another way. In what other sector in the UK... If your boss fails, if your business fails, do you then get a bonus? Well, obviously that's not a normal arrangement. Um, what I would just say about SVB UK is that you know, what happened here was an issue at the parent crystallised. Be a, be a, um, any other business where sure. it has a UK end of an international business, where else would you get paid a significant bonus? The, the point I'm getting at, isn't this creating moral hazard on a grand scale, well, which is that no matter where I work, if I'm in financial services, there is no downside for me personally. But that's why we have in place a regime by which bonuses have to be deferred and then they can be taken back. But will they be? Well, that's, that's to be judged. We don't, I, I, I don't think any of us <laughs> yet know the facts around that, so we're not going to comment on that. But what we do have in this country, and it's actually pretty unique to this country actually, is a regime where bonuses are deferred over a period of time, a period of years, and, can, and have to be surrendered if uh, you know, facts come to light, either in the performance of the individual or the performance of the firm subsequently, which you know, mean that that's the appropriate thing to do. We can't comment on Credit Suisse because that's a Swiss issue. Okay, but the, the facts have already come to light. You know, SVB went bust, Credit Suisse went bust, they've both been bought rather than resolved, they would have had to have been resolved otherwise, and yet their subsidiaries in the UK, their branches in the UK, will still get their bonuses. Is that reasonable? Well, here is to say, I'd make the, I would make a distinction here between what happened in the UK and for the UK bank of SVB and what happened at the group level. So, so the, the UK entity was well capitalised, it was liquid. The issue that knocked it out was that an issue crystallised a group which immediately spread into the UK and led to a run. So I, I, don't, I don't think that, you know, obviously that there have been quite severe consequences for anyone, any executives <coughs> that held any of their wealth in stock in those banks. Um, but I, I do think that you, you need to look to what happens in the US um, and you know, I'm quite sure there will be some quite significant consequences there. The Swiss have made some statements, but as Andrew said, it's not yet quite clear uh, exactly how they're going to handle um, Credit Suisse. But I would, I would, I know it's not the most popular thing in the world to say, but I would draw that distinction between what happened in the UK. I think if any taxpayer funds had been involved in the UK, in either of these entities, we'd be in a very, very different situation. I completely understand that, but the fact is that SBB did not have to go bust. It went bust because of the high risk taking um, activities of bankers in SVB um, who in the UK who are party to that regardless of whether they're in a usefully ring fence structure and as you said yourself Sam uh, and I think the governor said it was previously a branch it was only forced mm -hmm. to become a UK ring fence bank so suddenly by so virtue of action taken mm -hmm. by you the UK bank is now ring fenced, and so you're able to say, "Well, I would draw a distinction between the UK bank and the US parent." Is that fair? Is that fair? Okay, on this occasion, not to the taxpayer, but to those who are in effect paying for the financial system. Is it right that bankers still get bonuses even after what we saw? Well, following I can't just the add the point though. Crisis? That's why I mean that's in good part why we have this. Route regime whereby those bonuses then have to be deferred. And but you, 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 you've made. just said yourself, Governor, that you don't know if what will be the situation in SVB or CSF. Well, uh, we haven't had that discussion yet. But you will? Well, I'm sure it will be part of the supervision of the firm. Yeah, mm. I'm not HSBC now. 
Okay, and in terms of the senior certification, uh, senior managers and certification regime, do you think that um, there will be anyone who is held personally liable for the risks that have been taken, either in SVB or CSFB? Um, look, I don't want to get ahead of, of where we are on either of those cases. Um, um, Credit Suisse has had you know, a number of issues through time which accumulated in this event, and there's obviously been enforcement action taken um, against Credit Suisse in, in a number of ways in a different jurisdictions. Um, I think Silicon Valley Bank UK, uh, say I really don't want to comment on it in detail, but I would come back to the observation I made, which is about the distinction, as I see it, and you may or may not buy it, but between what happened in the UK and the way the UK entity was run and what happened you know, in terms of how that was sorted out in the UK and, and what happened in the US, I, I think there is a distinction there. You do seem to be saying all, all the way through this evidence session, Sam, that um, our regulation is better than anyone else's. And I'm not putting words in your mouth, that's how I'm hearing it. And you can, you can disagree, but nevertheless, is it not therefore the case that you as uh, PRA are going to have to look very carefully at all of the activities going on where headquarters are somewhere else in order to ensure that we don't just see this as wholesale where we end up owning a problem that perhaps we can deal with where it's a UK ring-fenced entity but where it, you know, in the case of SVB if it hadn't been if it hadn't become UK ring-fenced it would have been a massive problem for us not of our doing through regulation somewhere else that we disagree with so well, I was going to say I mean, can I just go back to what I said earlier it had to become a subsidiary because we have a policy that said you hit a trigger, mm. you have to become a subsidiary. So there is a. I mean, but if it was a million pounds under that trigger, it yeah. wouldn't have hit that trigger. So that that is you know that is fate. That is just how it uh, happened. Uh, it's more than it's more than fate, if you like. I mean, the bank, yeah, the bank was growing, and therefore it had to change. So are you saying then that had it been slightly <coughs> smaller, and therefore it hadn't hit that trigger, that the issue for the UK would have been. Well, I mean, I think it's the case that actually our, our supervisors said to it back in 2020, you are on a trajectory which means you will have to subsidiarise. Um, and so they did. So if, if this had happened in 2019, it was, what It was then? a much smaller yeah. institution at that point. We still had to deal with it, but it was a much smaller... So you're yeah. saying that actually even in small banks, the smaller end of small banks will present fewer systemic, fewer... Um, regulatory well, issues in the UK. Re refer back to something Sam said early on in this hearing. And we, this has been true for the PRA ever since we started it ten years ago. We do not operate a no-failure regime because that would have all sorts mm. of consequences if we did that. Maybe I can just add two brief comments. Well, one, you know, I do not contend that our regulation is better than everyone else's. No. I just think that would be a very foolish thing to do. Yeah. And in particular, I have great respect for the uh, the US and the way they run their system. As it happens in this case, there are some differences, which is what I was alluding to. Um, but on your, your, your broader point, but there is of course something in this. So we are a very large host of branches. So on the latest numbers I have, we've got 6.3 trillion pounds in branches in this country. It's more than 150 uh, branches. That I think is a necessary condition if we want to run a very large financial centre. Mm. But we've made a judgement, as Andrew says, around where to draw the line in terms of uh, what makes you have to become a subsidiary and we've enforced that. There is, I think, a legitimate question which may be of what you're sort of angling at, uh, and which I think we do need to reflect on is, you know, in light of you know how the system is evolving, is, is that threshold in exactly yeah. the right place? Mm, Might exactly. it be in another place? Yeah. I, I think that is an open question. But I, but I, I would want to impress upon you that we make a, a risk choice here that we host a lot of branches, and as set out very clearly in Andrew's letter, when you've got a branch you are massively more dependent on the home. And there is, of course, some risk in that arrangement. Mm. OK. Well, thank you very much. I would certainly be interested to see the outcome of um, both the senior managers and certification regime in terms of executives of SVB and Credit Suisse in the UK, but also to see whether, in fact, they do implement their um, deferrals of bonuses and so on hmm. and frankly why would bonuses be paid in any case and I, I still would assert that actually it's uh, their good fortune that they were in a UK ring fence bank because if they hadn't been they presumably would not be getting bonuses now. Thank you. Thank you Andrea. Yeah. Um.
Thank you, Chair. One of the tools in uh, the bank's toolbox uh, to deal with inflation uh, is to increase the uh, interest rate. Mm. But I think events have made it very clear that it's never quite that simple. There are macro and, and microeconomic events which mean that, that there are other things that have to be considered when you make those decisions about interest rates. Mm. In the market, certainly among the fund managers, there is a, a growing concern that what we're doing at the moment and the increasing uh, interest rate rise uh, will give rise to credit crunch. Mm. Do you share that concern? I, I divide it into two parts. So when we are setting monetary policy, taking <coughs> policy decisions, we always have to take into account credit conditions uh, in, in the UK. And we always do that. And you know, we did it last week when we took the, took the decision last week. And that's normal. Now, I would say, and, and our agents, have, our regional agents have said this, we see some evidence of, of some tightening in credit conditions, but we do not see uh, a, a critical development in that respect. Moreover, and in the context of the Financial Policy Committee, we think that the banking system in this country has uh, you know, ample capacity to lend to support credit. And uh, what would you do if that didn't happen? If you I'll, I'll come on to that, yeah. I, I just wanted to, to two more points. I'll come to that the point you just made as a second one, if you don't mind. What I, what I would draw a distinction is that what, because, and we said this in the letter to you, that we judge the UK banking system to be stable, safe and sound, is that the MPC, which received that assessment, by the way, that you have also received it from the FPC, uh, was able to conclude last week that it did not have to, if you like, aim off monetary policy uh, because of the stability of the financial system. And that's important. We have to take that decision without it. Now, to, to the point you rightly made, what would we do if we if we felt that capacity to you know, support credit in the economy was was compromised in any way or threatened? Well, the first thing we'd do in the FPC is to lower the uh, what we call the CCYB, the the, the, the counter cyclical capital buffer. Um, which we which we have we, we've set at two percent for for the banks, and we can do that. We did, it, we did it during the COVID. We did it immediately when the COVID uh, period started, and we could do it again. Now our current judgment is that in the last round of the FPC, the next one's coming out next week, is that we did not think that the credit conditions in this country required us to to, to, to take an action to release that buffer to support credit creation in the economy. We don't think the system is under that stress. But if it were, that's the action we would take. And just to correct, the FPC is coming out tomorrow. I'm sorry, yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> oh, thank you. Next day, not yeah. next week. I've, spent so many, I've been up too many nights. <laughs> <laughs> um, Governor, one of the things that has been uh, of concern, I think, uh, which seems to have driven m much change uh, very quickly, which has been difficult to deal with, is the speed with which you've raised interest rates now. We all appreciate that events uh, have put a lot of pressure and that action has been necessary, but in hindsight, do you think there were a different strategy, different, different, if you like, sensors that you could have had which would have made you think about increasing interest rates slowly, earlier, which therefore <laughs> wouldn't have had I, the I, consequences that we now see. I, I, have to, I have said before, and I'm afraid I'm going to say it again, that we don't have the luxury of hindsight decision making. So uh, I, I really will say that, I'm afraid. Um, what, what I will say is, I think it comes back to something Sam was saying earlier, is that, and, and I, you know, I absolutely agree with the point, we don't, have a, you know, we don't think our regulatory system is perfect, and if you think that, you're heading for a fall straight away. So I'm, I don't want to go, to go to that point. But what I would say is that, the, the, as, as Sam described, the way in which we treat the so-called interest rate risk in banks, uh, in, in the banking book as we call it, the fact that it has to go through to the profit and loss account and therefore hits, hits capital and that we require capital amongst it against those risks that are not treated in that way, means that we are, in a, we are in a, I think, in a, in a good position from the point of view of, of assessing the impact of raising interest rates on the position of the banks themselves. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a sense of risk that we do not have to, in, that, you know, in a sense, factor in because it's taken care of in the regulatory system in that sense. You say you don't have, uh, if you like, 
2020 vision and therefore the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. But foresight clearly is something which I imagine you're now going to be looking at. Yes, we do. Uh, we much do more, use that, yes. Much, much, much more <coughs> seriously. I think it was yesterday you commented that you had a concern about early retirees and the impact that might have mm. on inflation. How seriously do you take that risk? And what other things looking forwards now that we know we need to be more vigilant and have more well, foresight? Uh, what I said yesterday um, was in the context I was actually really making a speech about the role of the supply side of the economy uh, in, in what we experience and saying that during the last three years it's actually had a bigger role than you might normally, normally in normal conditions think. The point about um, labour supply is that we have had over the last three years an increase in so-called inactivity, that is people who are not working and not seeking to work. Now, many countries had that in the early stage of COVID. Um, many, many of those countries, that has now reversed itself, but it, it hasn't really reversed itself here. And it is concentrated in, more in the 50 to 64-year-old uh, age group. Now, there are two things going on here, one of which would have happened anyway, which, of course, the population is ageing, and so that would have, of course, have happened COVID or no COVID. But we've also seen this additional uh, effect that's happened during the, during the period of COVID. And that has tightened the labour market uh, relative to what we would normally expect. The point I, I made last night was that there was, a, there was a point, and we've discussed this many times here at the committee, I know, where you know, if you go back to the summer and early autumn, or the autumn of 2021, which is what was going to happen at the point when the furlough scheme ended. Now, we thought, and by the way, we thought rather less than most other forecasters, if you look back at the forecast, that it would lead to some increase in, in, in unemployment, that there would be a, a sort of so-called scarring in the economy that some firms would not be able to come back into business, and it would lead to unemployment and some slack in the economy, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't. And what it led to, or, or what happened was that there was an increase in inactivity in the economy, which means that, of course, the labour market isn't slackening in that sense. And the supply side has played a role in that. Now, you know, that was a judgment. You know, you're right about foresight. We have to use it all the time. And that was a judgment we had to make. Um, and things did turn out differently. I, I absolutely warrant that. I, I would say, and we publish in every monetary policy report a, um, a, a box which looks at what other forecasters are thinking. Actually, most other forecasters thought unemployment would go up more than we did. But yeah, that's, that's by the by. The point is, yes, that was a, that was a, you know, a judgment. That, that was key at the time, and it has turned out to be different. Right? And if I could just add two points to that. One, it was actually at this committee last May that we had a discussion around these issues, around labour participation, that, that our analysis has um, contributed to and, and has brought, brought it up the agenda, I think. Um, and you, you now see it very much as a focus of government policy to, to increase uh, participation and engagement with the labour market. I mean, the second thing I'd just say, and it sort of comes back to where we started, I mean, we've been, we're very conscious on the Monetary Policy Committee that we are putting up uh, rates and having to put up rates uh, uh, markedly because we're, we're concerned about the persistence in inflation. In terms of all of us are on the Financial Policy Committee, we've been flagging concerns around you know, what, what might be the implications of that increase in interest rates for whether it's for the, you know, we've been particularly focused on non-bank, uh, uh, what we call market-based finance. We've had, to, you know, following what we saw happening with the LDI episode where because of um, fiscal events we saw a, a very sharp increase in long-term rates, um, what the impact of that was. But, you know, long-term rates have been going up more progressively and, the, you know, pension funds and the like have had to adjust to that because the inflation environment and the interest rate environment has been changing. And I remember, you know, discussing this, you know, we were asked, well, where could the next risk crystallise? And, you know, we're, we're super alive to, you know, whether those risks could crystallise in the banking sector. We've got the regulation to deal with that. But also, you know, we have to be very vigilant to those risks from higher interest rates playing out in other parts of the economy. And, and that plays into the, the, the volatile and challenging environment we're in. 
Thank you. I'll leave it there, given Thank time. Thank you very much, Amory. And we're up against the bell, so I just want to reiterate my thanks, uh, Governor Thank um, Sam Sadev, um, to you for coming in at short notice to give us this update. Also to all of your teams for all of the hard work they did uh, through the night, um, going through this live stress test of the regime that has mm. been put in place and the test of your toolbox. And I know that you'll keep us posted as to how you look forward to uh, adjusting your stress test for the lessons that have been learned as a result of this uh, live one. Um, I think that, um, as Amory was just flagging, the question as to what impact this will have on the real economy and the tightness of the financial markets in the UK is still an open question. So I know that we will have uh, more questions for you on that. Uh, flag up, of course, uh, to the watching public that we are doing an inquiry on quantitative tightening and the, uh, the fact that not many people really know what the impact of that might be. Uh, and uh, we will be coming in and doing some evidence sessions at the bank itself. And uh, just to reiterate the need uh, for vigilance, thank you for your vigilance, uh, you. gentlemen. And uh, order, order, I declare this session closed. Thank you very On much. On time. Thank you. <laughs>